Hello again and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe channel where we are on the series about our sacred history. Now, we are looking at quite a volatile time period in this um, kind of area we're looking at now in this part of the study. And we've seen, I'm just going to recap very briefly, so we have seen the major line of the knowledge that we have, which is the king line, the priest line, and the prophet line, are now centred in Jerusalem. And we've seen the um, kind of kings and the individuals and the family lines that play up to this point here, just before they get uh, taken over by Nebuchadnezzar II. And we see why these lines are important, the roles they play, and the knowledge they have that they've passed on and continued all the way from the pharaohs, from Atophis, um, to Atonism, and then now into Judaism and the kings of um, Jerusalem. However, we've also looked at um, how the Assyrians were uh, created and the Babylonia, uh, the significance of the tribes being formed from the clans and the bloodlines involved within the Hyksos people also. We've also looked at the other side of the Hyksos people which is where we the founding of Phoenicia and how um, part of the line or the majority of the line from there moved over to Carthage to escape the pre-coming chaotic period from the um, from the east because this massive force of the Assyrians was building into this overwhelming um, multitude of uh, the old kingdom being pieced back together and has now been pushing back to the west to reclaim its old lands. Part of that is to take over Jerusalem with Nebuchadnezzar II. Um, again we will look at that in the next video but they're looking to reclaim the king line and the knowledge and uh, kind of the ultimate title of being the, the, the uh, king of the world effectively in this area. Uh, so Dido takes uh, her part of the knowledge from the Hyksos people over to Carthage which is being protected by way of Egypt because you know um, the Assyria will have to come through Egypt to get to Carthage at that time. We've not looked at the Greek ship, we're going to do that in a separate part of the series um, and where they come from in relation to the Hyksos. Um, but we've seen, so we've got the Assyrians centered in Babylonia who are moving over to the west in a big force to try and reclaim their old old Mesopotamian um, birthright, really. So there's another factor here we have to now consider, and that is the Persians. Now the Persians are a bit of a wild card, and I've got a speculation about this, which is, you know, it's unconfirmed, but it makes perfect sense. So if we have this massive... Um, force that's being gathered from the territories in Syria. There is a little bit of um, land, I think it's where the Iranians are, which is between the old lands of Mesopotamia on the very eastern border and the um, uh, Indian the Vedic um, mountains. And it's these tribes here that are being, uh, so they're not related to a line or anything like that, they're completely individual societies, um, they don't really have much to do with anything, they're just really small clans and villages. What they do is, because of the threat of the um, Assyrian uh, development on their border, if they don't know that they're not going to come for them next, they, they just assume that a natural progression will be to invade their own lands. So they band together to become one, uh, one community under one king, and that king um, in 675 to 640 BC is called King Tesepis, which becomes the first king of the Persians. Now, what happens is these people are so scared of being taken over by the Assyrians, they unite and fight back and start pushing into the um, western, uh, or the eastern side to the west border of the Assyrians. Now, at, exact, at this same time, an individual arrives to the Persian Empire because they're pretty, pretty primitive at this point. They've got no technical advancement, no religions, it's just tribal communities. Now, a man called Zoroaster, a very famous individual, appears from absolutely nowhere, not from their people, and he becomes their teacher and he guides them to become united to start developing and start pushing against the Assyrians. So where does this man come from? There's no written record of him. He has, he's just much, very much like a Tophis and Osiris do to the Egyptians. He turns up and starts helping the people uh, develop with this advanced knowledge. Now the only other place this knowledge is held is Mount Carmel and the Prophet. So is it not too far a distinction to say that one, 
Jerusalem, and especially Mount Carmel, being aware of the events over in the, uh, the east with the Assyrians, fearing for the safety of Jerusalem, decide that steps need to be taken, and they're not able to fight themselves because the force of the Assyrians is too great. So if they send a, a man, a prophet, with all this knowledge and information over to the unifying Persians on the other side of the Assyrian kingdom and start getting them to create a force that is um, a bit more developed, a bit more organized, a bit more advanced, and start pushing back into the rear side of the Assyrians, will that prevent the halt of Nebuchadnezzar II from taking Jerusalem? It's a very clever ploy, and this is my theory behind it. So they send this man Zarosta over to Persia and start integrating their beliefs into their native beliefs, which is why uh, his teachings are so similar to the great line of knowledge and Atonism and Judaism, but equally different in the languages because it has to relate to the Persian people's native belief system, which is all to do with uh, fire, for example. But the images of Zarosta are very similar to white caped men of the Essenes from Mount Carmel, just like um, the prophets would be later on, so we can establish similarities here. So it's not a coincidence that they appear and provide information just like those that Mount Carmel will do later on in the future. Um, but seemingly unlinked together, it's because he came from there. Now, so he starts getting the Persians to mobilize, to ad advance and attack. Unfortunately, it does his job far too well. And the Persians sweep across the Western Plain from the east. Um, and this, you know, again, it kind of works in, hand in hand with the plan because Assyria is so committed to retaking its colonies, its lands back and getting the line of knowledge and the king making ritual uh, from Jerusalem and, and Egypt. It, it, they ploughing over to the west themselves, so all their forces are on the western border pushing forwards. So when the Persian Empire from the east, in force in mass and led by Zoroaster uh, and King Tepes, push from the from the east to the west, there's no there's no resistance, there's nothing to stop them, and so they completely flatten the majority of the Mesopotamian Empire and the Assyrian Empire and actually begin to um, circle Babylonia. And we'll look at again this in a bit more detail, but they actually um, make Babylonia and Phoenicia and Jerusalem, because remember Babylonia now includes Jerusalem, they make them subservient um, vassals to the uh, Persian Empire. So they're allowed to keep their culture, their rulership, um, and all the people they've taken from Jerusalem, they keep them there in Babylonia, but ultimately are a part of um, the Persian Empire. So inadvertently, when, uh, again we'll look at it in more detail, when Babylonia takes the people from Jerusalem to their capital, they accidentally protect them from the outside Persian advance. Uh, so it's quite clever really. And we have to we have to imagine that the people of Mount Carmel, the prophet line, had a very large hand uh, part of this entire setup. And whether or not that played out exactly as they planned, I'm sure they didn't want to lose Jerusalem, but um, it definitely fell in a way that favoured them overall. Uh, and so, yeah, it's an extremely important event that happened in this period, but we have to look at why it happened. You know, these people didn't just appear, a prophet didn't just magically come from their own uh, unadvanced civilization. You know, he was planted there by the Mount Carmel, the Essenes, and, and the prophet line um, over in, in the east to provide a distraction for these um, Assyrians that were pushing to them um, in the west. So it was like a. Um, almost like a, uh, well, it's a strategic ploy, isn't it, to try and protect yourself is by attacking from the rear. And if you don't have forces yourself in the rear, you make some or you create allies um, unaware to themselves, perhaps, that they were uh, used in that way. But that explains in great detail why the, the Persians um, did what we did, became the empire they were and played the role that they were played in the line. So that's the bit we're going to leave it on. In our next video, we will look at the specific taking 
of Jerusalem by Babylon, and we will look at that. But we've looked at the kind of the major plates in this time period, so that around um, that period uh, when uh, Sirius the Great, uh, Cyrus the Great, and Darius the Great were around. Um, then, you know, that's those are the people we're looking at. We're looking at the Persians, the Assyrians, um, the um, Jude, uh, Jewish people from from the from uh, Jerusalem, uh, and we're also looking at the Phoenicians, and then on the outskirts, the Carthaginians, uh, and that's how these old people kind of interlace. So just looking at it again, so we've got King Tespes at 675 to 640 BC. Uh, Zoroaster was around there at 650, so exactly the same period, which is when he started to move to the uh, to the west. So we have um, King Tespes' uh, son, Aramanus, and then Cyrus, 625 and 600, uh, and then Cyrus's son, Cambyses, at 580 to 559 BC. So hope you've enjoyed. Please follow us on the rest of um, these uh series so we can see what happens to these individual civilizations as we go so thank you very much and goodbye hello again and welcome to the blueprint of the universe channel where we are on the series about our sacred history now we are looking at a, quite a volatile time period in this um, kind of area we're looking at now in this part of the study and we've seen i'm just going to recap very briefly so we have seen the major line of the knowledge that we have which is the king line the priest line and the prophet line are now centered in jerusalem and we've seen the um, kind of kings and the individuals and the family lines that play up to this point here just before we get uh, taken over by nebuchadnezzar the second and we see why these lines are important, the roles they play, and the knowledge they have that they've passed on and can.